Hello again. I'm Wally Wood, host of The Revelation File. We welcome you to this, our 20th episode, and we thank you for being with us today. A few episodes ago, I introduced you to the idea, the concept of digenomics. We were talking about the State of the World Report in our earlier episodes, and I entered into your introduction into a cashless system that would affect the entire world, a cashless, moneyless system. And I called it digenomics. This was a word that I came up with in 1998. And I want to take you deeper into this matter of the evolution of a cashless, moneyless system, not just for this nation, not just for a few nations, but for the entire world. So we're calling this our digenomic world. Now, you can reach us at the Revelation File News Service, and we have uh, the website, therevelationfile.com and wallywoodministries.com. You can reach us through either of those two websites. The prophesied future, as foretold in Daniel chapter 2 and Revelation 13, addresses the matter of the evolution of world history into a one world, new world system at the end of time. I've said before that you can actually, you've heard a lot about the new world order. Go into Daniel chapter 2 and you'll read some of the finer details of it, as well as in the Revelation 13, how one man would come forth and rule every nation on earth, declaring himself to be God, just like the ancient Caesars of Rome did. They proclaimed themselves to be the deity of that empire, and it will come forth again in the last days, known as the Antichrist. So in these two particular chapters of Scripture, you can read the history of the future of this empire, this last empire before Jesus comes back. And I've said before that when the pundits prophesy, the prophets are vindicated. And what you see here is a collection, a small collection of the books that I have in my expansive library that address this matter of the new money system, the new global system. Uh, my book, The Cashless Society, came out in 1974. I was told a few years later that I wrote, I wrote one of the earliest books on that subject at that time. The Day the Dollar Died, New Rules for the New Economy. Kevin Kelly was a founder of Wired Magazine, <clears throat> and he addressed the new world economic system in that book. Don Tapscott in his book, Digital Capital, Database Nation, Bill Gates, Business at the Speed of Thought. That was unheard of a generation and a half ago. Willard Cantlin, in his book in the 70s, New Money or None. His first book, The New World Money System, came out in the late 60s. Foreign Policy Journal, Would Fewer Currencies Make More Sense? Another friend of mine, E-Business or Out of Business, wrote that book. Uh, my book came out in 74. Paul McGuire's book came out in 2008. Kevin Kelly's was that same year, 2008. Don Tapscott wrote about it in 2000. Simpson Garfield, or Garfunkel rather, of the Database Nation, his book came out in 2000. Uh, Bill Gates' book came out in 1999. Willard's book came out in 79 and in 1969. The Foreign Policy Journal was published in 1999 and Mark's book in 2000. So these are not recent treatises on this new economy. You can see it going all the way back to the 60s and the 70s. We've been talking about this money to the system coming forth. Another book of interest that I have in my library, The New International Economic Order. And this was uh, put out by the United Nations, <clears throat> laying the groundwork, the architecture by which the wealth of the West would be siphoned into the developing nations of the rest of the world, and we wouldn't be able to stop it. The new international economic order. Uh, the UN representative at the time, Albert Richardson, said that from this point forward, things will never be the same, and it hasn't been. That was, came out in 1980. The single global currency. There's a website that has that same name, Common Sense for the, for the World, speaking of a single global currency doing away with all international monetary uh, existence as we know it today, doing away with all different uh, denominations of currency and bringing it down to a single global currency. That came out in 2006. 
Alvin Toffler wrote his book, Creating a New Civilization, in which, again, he addressed this matter in 1994. Blur, The Speed of Change in the Connected Economy. That came out in 1998. One World or None. This was produced by the Federation of American Atomic Scientists in 2007, gathering together the essays of nuclear scientists that go all the way back to the 30s and the 40s, addressing the need for a single global government or the world would not survive. One World, Ready or Not, William Greider. He was the editor of Rolling Stone magazine in 1997. That's when he produced this book in which he talked about global markets coming together in a single economic plan. One World, The Ethics of Globalization by Peter Singer. He's a bio bioethics professor at Princeton University, and he produced this book in 2002, addressing the ethics of a global united world system. These stories and more are in our archives, and again, we'll be bringing these to you in upcoming episodes of The Revelation File. The Bible predicts that in the last days a global economic system would be established that would impact every human on earth. It would be a system built around, based upon, and operated by numbers. Not only would the system itself be digital, but every person alive would have their identities reduced to little more than numbers as well. We call this digital economics or diginomics. I came up with that word in 1998 and it's now experiencing global tracking. You can read more about it at my website at digenomicscentral.com or at another website that we share with a friend in Canada, digenomics.com. Welcome to the Digenomic Era, a global cashless society. The world's going global, and it's doing so electronically. Everything is going digital including the way we handle and spend money. We're going from a cash system to a cashless system, all because of technology. Digenomics, the emergence of a totally digital economy. The definition, an acronym for digital economics, the technological and social development toward an all-digital economy conducted electronically in all f financial dealings between buyer and seller. A cashless society where all financial transactions are conducted electronically. And this you can find in Merriam-Webster's dictionary, online dictionary, online. And I came up with that word in 1998. They picked it up in 2007. And now a host of online dictionaries are picking it up as well. If you do a general search of the word Digenomics, you're going to find it has global tracking everywhere. We've got Digenomics IT, that's a website in Italy. You've got a, uh, a digital uh, press printing company called Digenomics. In the upper left, BBC Digenomics, Promises and Perils. This was a, a conference that they held a few years ago. And you just go down the page and you see the many applications and uses of the word digenomics. A particular recent note to me is the fact that, first of all, the digenomics.com website in Canada, uh, they picked up the rights for the domain and they've allowed me to have my own website and, and uh, email through them. Uh, we've become very good friends and partners in that effort. Digenomics.it is in Italy. What you see here is Digenomics, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office in 2011. An attempt was made by a couple of gentlemen in the States to secure a trademark <clears throat> for the word Digenomics for their own personal gain. Uh, they were granted that trademark for a short while, and upon further diligence, the attorneys found that uh, they were not the owners of that word, they were not the creators of that word that I am. And so the trademark was revoked at that point, but you can still go to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office and see that bold headline for Digenomics and tell us the story behind that particular uh, trademark uh, filing. Forbes magazine in uh, 2006, I believe it was, 2008, 
put out an article entitled Digenomics. <clears throat> and that was one of the first early published articles in a major media outlet on the term and the, the concept of a digital economic world system. And of particular note to me, most recently, Seoul, South Korea has now adopted Digenomics as a new strategy to boost city growth. And this is a press release put out by the Korea Bizwire uh, not too long ago, Digital Technology to Define Seoul's Future. As you can see in this particular press release, from the caption, you had one, two, three, four, five, six uses of the word Digenomics in this official press release from the government of Seoul, South Korea. When you go to their website, you find not just one usage of the word and one page addressed to that word, as well as the tab on that page, but you have this particular page and the following page, which Digenomics bears a strong presence <clears throat> in their 2020 digital master plan to uh, make Seoul the most uh, digitized city in the world. And they've committed themselves to the Digenomic program. The world is going cashless. Are we ready for this? Cashless payment in the worldwide uh, map shows the varying different degrees by which each of these nations are prepared to go totally cashless. Uh, one particular uh, site shows that cashless society is already here. Where could we have that? It must be here. Shopping for snacks in Stockholm has got a lot simpler in recent years. My PIN code, and then it's done. In part, that's thanks to cashless payment systems, like the one developed by entrepreneur Peter Friedel. Cash presents a lot of problems for society as a whole. I mean, a lot of people actually want to use cash, but in Sweden, it's definitely lower and lower and lower. While an estimated 55% of U.S. consumer payments are made with cash, in Sweden, that number is now down to 41%. We are connected to the cashier system. We're there. But we also have the, uh, the network because we're sitting on the mobile data network. So we're up in a store in a second. Fidel's firm, Seamless, now operates in 30 different countries. But here in internet-enabled Sweden, it's just one of several companies competing to replace cash. It's a strong IT uh, digital uh, entrepreneurship phase in Sweden now. Where entrepreneurial companies really want to challenge the old banking industry by providing these new um, innovative mobile payment services. The old banking industry has reacted, with six of Sweden's largest banks banding together in 2012 to build an instantaneous mobile payment platform, Swish. We share the development costs. We see that uh, customers are adopting new technology like mobile payments. And of course, we also saw this uh, need uh, where we could replace uh, cash. The idea that banks could cooperate to kill off cash might be unthinkable elsewhere. But it's not so surprising in Sweden, where bills and coins recently constituted less than 3% of the country's domestic product. That's compared to an average across the euro area of almost 10%. Many bank branches here no longer carry hard currency. Homeless magazine vendors, like Jimmy here, use wireless card readers to accept credit and debit card payments. Can I press this? Yeah. And certain cell phone stores sport signs saying, no cash accepted. But in Sweden, which printed Europe's first banknotes 350 years ago, these new technologies have not stopped the central bank from designing new notes for 2015. This is, is a security feature that will be on all of them. Susanna Gruffman may control the country's physical currency, but says she herself never carries cash. We are quite neutral, even though we are the one who, who provide the society with cash. We don't necessarily say that cash is, for example, when you look at efficiency, the best payment instrument. In a nation where ever fewer retail transactions are carried out in cash and almost everyone has access to the internet, the new kroners coming out next year may be the last ones the Swedes ever need. Do you have any cash in your wallet? Do I have cash in my wallet? I do not. There's nothing in there. And the fact is, here in the city today, I'm not going to buy any pot, and I'm not going to visit any strip clubs. So now that I can pay for a taxi with plastic, I should be okay. My name is
is David Woolman. The book is called The End of Money. In a way, cash is being subjected to this death by a thousand cuts. When you get paid, it's not a handful of cash. Or when you're paying for your health insurance, or the dentist, and the whole bit. Do you have any cash in your wallet? Um, currently, no. <laughs> I'd probably say in like the last five years, I haven't really used cash. It's it. It's you mean poverty. We've already pushed cash to the margins, and it still dominates for a lot of small value transactions, right? Cigarettes, candy bar, your restaurant check for people who really hate credit cards. This looks really good. Oh, too bad. So there's this suite of new technologies, and I would say mobile is kind of the anchor as far as pushing cash toward the edge of this cliff. I think I would like a cup of the fresh mint with the lavender shortbread. And I have pay with Square, so charge it to David Walman. Thank you. With this particular app, the phone keeps track of where I am. For the merchant, they see a picture of me on the screen of their quote-unquote register, which is really just an iPad. It's hands-free, which actually matters. Uh, you know, recently I was buying ice cream, and it was toddler in my right hand, and two ice cream cones in my left hand, and long line of people. And then I had to get to the register, and I have to pay. Now what? So now it's not just a little convenient, now it's very convenient. I'm not an advocate for the cashless future tomorrow. And I hear this quite a bit from people. Well, how are we going to pay undocumented workers? Panhandlers is a big one, too. You know, you and your cashless future excitement, you know, are you really interested in just stiffing all the panhandlers of the world? The short answer is, of course not. We can't go there until we have a way to actually tip people that's electronic. It's amazing that it works as well as it does, considering we don't transact using anything of real value. You know, food, electricity, blankets. You know, I give you this worthless slip of paper and you give me dinner, or you educate my children, or you provide me with healthcare, or I give you a digital version of this useless thing. And it, it somehow works. Now, the money supply is already driven by the return key. So the cat is out of the bag on that one. That was David Woolman. He writes, why not one money for one world? Backers of a single earth currency envision a great smoothing of transactions, an end to damaging currency speculation, and less economic turmoil, which could mean greater prosperity for all. He wrote that in 2012. He goes on to say, we have the technology to move to a more efficient, convenient, freely flowing medium of exchange. E-money is no longer just a matter of geeks playing games. He wrote in Wired magazine, June of 2009, the world's governments remain stuck in the past, in an era where books, movies, music, and newsprint are transmuting from atoms to bits. Money remains irritatingly analog. Physical currency is a bulky, germ-smeared, carbon-intensive, expensive medium of exchange. Let's dump it. End of quote. Joel Kurtzman, in his 1993 book entitled The Death of Money, he was the former editor-in-chief of the Harvard Business Review and business editor and columnist for the New York Times. And in his book, he wrote this. Money now is different. It is no longer a thing. It is a system. Money now is a network connected to huge number-crunching supercomputers and to PCs everywhere. In the new world of money, even the largest banks no longer need vaults. Tangible money, old-fashioned money, is going away. The new megabyte money is now an image. End of quote. An image. At Diginomics.com, we have our own television program, our television network. And my partner, Travis Patron, in Canada, he's the host of that particular TV series. You might want to go to YouTube and just look up Diginomics.com uh, or just the word Diginomics, and you'll find all of his uh, postings of, of video there on YouTube and from our Diginomics.tv segment.
a whole new world emerging. Money wants to be free. The rise of e-payments. Revelation 13, 16 through 17, very familiar, but it's particularly pertinent right now in our day and time. It was forced upon all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had that mark. If you'll remember in that last commercial from MasterCard, the glove was worn on his right hand. Welcome to the now future. I've said this before, technologically, we're there. The Bible is proving to be as relevant as our headlines and the trends of the world. It talks about a cashless, moneyless system that's coming in the next administration of the, of the world, from this next global empire. You will not be able to buy or sell. You will not be able to work. You will not be able to produce unless you have that mark. In future programs, we'll go into this even further and show how we're much farther down the line than most people are aware of. Um, and this is for the purpose of alerting the church. It's intended to change our priorities, if you will. Jesus said that in those days, it'd be like the days of Noah. And one of the things he mentioned there was that they would be marrying and giving in marriage. So what's wrong with that? Well, when you think about that and you study in the scripture, you discover that it becomes part of the activities of earth that take higher priority than the Lord himself. In fact, he has to be fit within the schedule of everybody's busy schedule. When people get married, on average, usually speaking, they're not thinking in terms of the Lord's plan. They're not thinking in terms of the destiny that he has for them, his plan for their lives, or anything of that nature. They are marrying and giving in marriage. They're focused on the things of earth, of one another, raising a family, building a career, going to college, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that would be prevalent in the last days. There'll be people who, the bulk of the people will claim to know him, to serve him, to believe in him. But in their hearts, their focus, their primary priority are the things of earth. I'm not a prophet of gloom and doom. I've never claimed to be a prophet. And I don't have to specialize in gloom and doom. The, uh, the trends and the events of the day are gloom and doom enough. And if you really want to read the source of what you accuse us to be of gloom and doom, just read the Bible. It doesn't pull punches. It doesn't sugarcoat it or cover it over. We're headed into a time, the likes of which the world has never seen before. And Jesus said, no, nor ever shall be again. And there is coming a day when the attitudes of the world, the pursuits of the world, the fears, the phobias of the world, would carry them down a path. Just as it was in the days of, of the ancient days in which Israel required a ruler over them. They demanded to have a human ruler. And as God told Moses, he said, they're rejecting me, so they'll have the king they deserve. And so, again, we're going back full circle because that was in the time frame of the flood that came upon the world. The world is looking for a charismatic leader, somebody that they can trust, somebody that they can believe in, someone they can follow, a man on a white horse. And those days are fast upon us. I'm not saying they're approaching, they are upon us. And what we have seen in over 40 years of research and news gathering along these lines, and I've spent my, my entire career building a library of what the world is saying. The Lord told me way back in 1972, read the world. In there you will find the fulfillment of my prophetic word 
and what the world is saying, what the world is pursuing. So I've given my, my entire life to this research for the sole purpose of alerting the body of Christ to the time that we're living in. It's not to be intended to be a frightening time. This is not intended to be a frightening message. It's intended to be a, a wake-up call, a clarion call. Body of Christ, this is the hour that Jesus said must come before he returns. And these would be the signs of his coming in the lifetime of that generation. We've said it throughout this entire series since we've been on the air. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, that the generation that saw these things of which he was prophesying would not pass away until all had been fulfilled, which included his return. That generation would see everything. I've, as I've noted before, in one generation, the generation of our parents and our grandparents, we went from the transportation system of Rome to landing a man on a moon. And it's gotten even tighter now. So we invite you to come back and see more episodes. Uh, we will take you into the deeper news, into the global trends, and show how the Bible is being fulfilled in our lifetime at this moment in this hour. I'm Wally Wood. Thank you so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you in our next episode. You've been watching the Revelation File Report with Wally Wood, a Wally Wood Ministries production from Houston, Texas. You are able to support the ministry by donating at wallywoodministries.com and by mail at Wally Wood Ministries, P.O. Box 42005, Houston, Texas 77242. Wally is available to present full two-hour forums in your city called the Revelation File News Forum. For more details, contact Andy Valdez at 713-560-3348 or by email at andy at andyvalidez.com. The Revelation File News Report is a weekly update of global trends in the news as it aligns with end-time Bible prophecy. Tune in again next time, and be sure to like and share this channel.